I'm excited to be here tonight in the house of the Lord <clears throat> because, um, man, God is good. God is good. I'm, I'm just, I'm just listening. To, I'm just looking. I'm looking. Tonight we're going to talk about a really, to me, one of the neat things. That's, that's part of being a believer. One of the neat ways that God ministers to us, and I've spoken about this before here, and uh, tonight we're going to take a little different tact, a little different angle, but we're going to talk about the prophetic tonight. But I want to introduce something to you that is a requirement of a believer if you're going to operate in the prophetic. Now, a lot of people think that you get the prophetic anointing by standing in a long line and getting hands laid on them, or, you know, it, if your tithe is... You know, should be ninety-eight dollars and sixty-four cents. You actually give a hundred. That that extra, you know, dollar uh, and thirty-six cents or whatever that would be, uh, would would be towards the operating in the in the gifts. You'd be surprised at what people think that. Well, I've been to church all my life and I've never prophesied. <clears throat> okay. I want to ask you a couple questions because tonight we're going to talk about an interesting thing, and I'm going to ask you a couple questions or pop quizzes, and. Uh, I, I, I want to know if you know the answers, okay? Well, you don't have to scream them out, but if you do, you know, go ahead. How many different persons make up what we would call the Trinity? Okay, so four of you. Right. Now listen, I'm going to blow some people's minds tonight, okay? Um, I come from, from a... From a, a, a a little different background, a mix of different things, not only the Baptist and stuff, but the Pentecostal charismatic movement and stuff. But I have opportunity to visit churches all over the, all over the planet, literally, see all kinds of different belief systems, and uh, people are very confused on the, on the function and the role of the Trinity. I'm not going to get real deep into them. I just want to show you a couple things tonight about our God. And the reason I'm going to talk about these things tonight is because I want you to see that God has a plan for you that goes back eons. Anybody know what an eon is? That's a long time. Very technical biblical term. Don't worry, I'm a doctor, right? Very, very technical term. Goes back a long time, okay? Now, a lot of people look and they, and, and we, and we see God or we talk to God and we look at him as a single person because we know the Lord our God is one God, right? And we look at that, but then there's really confusing terminology in the Word of God that will mess that up. If He's only one God, why, do, why, why is the word Elohim that uh, is in the very first verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, <clears throat> very, first, very first reference of God, there is a Hebrew word Elohim, and Elohim is a plural. Everybody know what that is? That means more than one. Well, I don't know why those guys would say something like that. <clears throat> but I want to kind of mess you up on a couple of things. I'm going to ask you to start with tonight. If you can tell me where Jesus got the term son from. Do you know when Jesus became the son of God? Has he always been the son of God? See, I hear yeses and I hear no. Oh, this is going to be a tense moment tonight, folks. <clears throat> Has he always been the son of God? I'm going to break your heart, so I'm going to tell you no. And I'm going to show you. And I'm going to show you why this is important. This is a good thing for us, folks. This is a good thing. Okay? I, listen, I, we're, we're going to go deep in here for, for a few minutes here. But, but we're, going to, we're going to go deep. <clears throat> um, man. Jesus was not the son of man or the son of God. No, these are great. They look funny, but they work great. You see, I, I, have, I have 2012 vision. That's better than 2020, right? But I asked my doctor when I was in getting a flight physical, because I fly airplanes, and I, I asked him, I said, how come I can't see the Bible at the end of the day? And he said, that's 40 vision. When you hit 40, put on some reading glasses. I know, right? They're good looking, too. Yeah, I know. You're going to want some. I should sell some of these. Y'all would want some of these. <clears throat> God has existed forever. Okay? 
He is, he is forever and ever. There is never a moment when God was created. But I'm going to show you also that God existed in multiple parts. That there's a lot of people that teach that, uh, that the Trinity or this, this belief in, in three parts to make up one God is some kind of uh, thing we've invented in the last few hundred years while we've been translating the Bible over and over again, and they seem to think that, uh, uh, that, that these references don't make sense. And they, they seem to think, well, that's just man's idea of something or some, you know, some myth or whatever. But I want to I read some stuff out of Hebrews to you for a moment. And then we're going to go into Luke, and then we're probably going to go into Daniel, and then we'll talk about some other stuff. Now, why is this important? Because I want to teach you something about Jesus, about Christ, about the Son of God, that's important to know because he did something so that we could be like him. And I'm not saying we're going to be gods. Don't get me wrong. Okay, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going there. When I say like him, I mean we can be adopted into the family. Okay, we can be called the sons of God. Okay, so I, I've, I've confused you enough already. I've, gotten, I've got the answer of, of has, has Jesus always been the son of God? We've got yeses and we've got noes. This is going to be tense. There will be a brawl here tonight. <clears throat> Let me ask you this. I, I'm also going to ask you, there's, there's, a, there's a point over here in, uh, in, in Daniel that we're going to look at, and, I'm gonna, and, and he's going to be looking prophetically. He's going to be looking forward at things. And I'm going to show you a point in time where God the Father comes here to earth before the end of days. Do you all know that? Do you all know that? Oh, it's good. We all talk about Jesus' second coming, but do you know when Jesus' second coming comes, when he comes in the clouds, do you know who's here to meet him? God the Father. Okay, we'll, we'll get there. It's all right. It's a, don't, don't worry. <clears throat> I have a very special Bible. It's printed exactly the way I like to teach things. But I think you'll find the same words in yours. All right? I'm just saying. All right. Hebrews chapter 1 said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time, passed unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, he's, the word here, by the way, uh, God, Hebrew, uh, excuse me, the book of Hebrews was actually written in what language? Do you all know? Nope. It was written in Hebrew. <coughs> Paul wrote in his native tongue. Paul wrote the book of Hebrews in Hebrew. It was translated into Greek later by a guy named Luke. Aha! <coughs> All right, just like what, okay, what language was Daniel written in? <laughs> That's pretty good. It wasn't written in Hebrew. That was the question I was going to ask. It was written in Aramaic. <clears throat> All right. So we're, so we're looking at different languages here. But anyways, let me uh, just use a couple words that are common to us here. Uh, the word God here, this is, this is talking about God the Father. And I'll prove this out in a little bit. But it's, God ta it's talking about God the Father. Who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. In other words, in days of old, <clears throat> prior to the time of Christ, if God wanted to get a message to his people, he would speak through someone. And that someone, if they, if they uttered the word that God spoke, if they brought that word, they were called a what? A prophet. Right? Now, I love prophecy. It says to desire, Paul said to desire earnestly all the spiritual gifts, but above all that ye may prophesy. Right? I mean, look, if we're prophesying, we're bringing the word of the Lord. And, and we all know that prophesying is really fun, especially if it's bringing it reading somebody's mail, because a lot of the time it isn't, it isn't just patting them on the back saying, God says you're doing great. A lot of times there's a corrective word in there that sometimes you, when you're up here doing this, you put the microphone aside and you whisper it in their ear because it's nobody else's business. But it certainly gets a person's attention because they know there's no way you know what they know. And when you bring it, they know that it was God and not you, and so he brings reproof into people's life through the word of the prophets. <sighs> All right. So in times past, God spoke through the prophets, right? And we all desire to prophesy. We all desire to be one. 
I know a lot of people that prophesy. In fact, everybody in the room here should prophesy. In fact, Revelation chapter 19 says, if, if you don't know how to prophesy, it says that the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So if you ever mention that you're saved, you just prophesy. Because are you in your glorified body yet? No. I'm healed. I'm set free. I'm delivered. Am I completely delivered from the flesh yet? It's a work in progress. But if I say he saved me, he healed me, he delivered me, I just prophesied threefold. Because I talked about the works of Christ in my life. And according to God's word, that is the spirit of prophecy. So I'm declaring, I'm, I'm starting to set down here that I'm declaring something that may not quite be finished yet. That's what prophecy is all about. That's why when we look back at the Old Testament prophets, we say, wow, that was really cool. They knew 50, 100, 400, 800, 1,000 years before something happened. They knew it was going to happen. Oh, and they cared to write it down. You ever, you ever sit in church and you're just saying, Lord, give me a prophetic word. And then somebody says something, you're like, I knew they were going to say that, but you can't prove it. You know what I mean? You, you, I mean, you, you, you want to you, you wanna think, oh, I'm hearing from you now, Lord, but you can't prove it. Write down your dreams and visions. See what we find. See 400 years from now when Christ is ruling and reigning on the earth, if they find your book, they find your diary, and they say, man, that Kim, she was hooked up. She was rolling in the Word. So we should all desire that thing. Okay, so uh, this God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. All right. Any, any idea what in the world he's saying right there? He's greeting the Hebrews, and uh, he's saying that uh, you know, God used to speak through the prophets, but now he speaks through his Son. Now, I just read something in there, and I'll tell you that the, the King James Version, and I'm going to step on some more toes here. I'm going to tell you the King James Version is the closest thing we have to a real good translation into English. Okay, from the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek. And the reason that is is because it has a lot of neat little uh, gizmos and gadgets in it, like the word thee and thou and thine, you know, single person, first, second, or, or, or uh, you know, tenses. First, first, second, and third person tenses that uh, if I say, uh, David, if I say unto thee, give I whatever, or thine is the kingdom. And, and I looked at it. Now, if I say you, I could say you, or I could say you, or I could say you, or I could say you, but if I say thy or thine, it's a single person. So, I'm, so anyways, I, I, I say that because I'm always in defense of, of the King James. I love the other translations and stuff they're really fun to read some are really fun to you know see what they left out i'm just saying <clears throat> listen i read the nearly inspired version i mean i mean uh, the niv for a long time oh i'm stepping on some toes i don't care anyways the reason i bring this up is because we translate things into english to make sense in an english sentence right Okay, if I read this to you in the original Hebrew, it wouldn't make much sense to you. Or if I even read it the way that Luke translated into Greek. But the word here, son, it says by his son. It says it's spoken to us by his son. Actually is a term that, that best translates in son. It's the word en, en. There's no the or, or, excuse me, there's no his in the statement. And the, and the actual word is a singular word that means the one and only son. And what's really interesting about the word is the word is used in describing an appointment or a position. Something or somebody when, he, when God is doing something in Son, He's doing it in a, through a particular position or a particular manner that's indicative of, of this thing, but it's not identifying a person. Isn't that interesting? We know who He's talking about here. We know He's talking about Jesus, but the word in means here, means in or through Son, 
And a better description of the word wouldn't just be son, it would be sonship. We've all heard that word, haven't we? Tonight we're going to talk about prophetic sonship. Okay? You see, Jesus took on a role in order that we might take on a role. Does that make sense? Watch this. We're going we're gonna to go here for just a moment here. The word in son uh, should read sonship. Um, it's the only sense of, of, this, of this word in the position of son. It literally means the only begotten. Now, the word begotten means what? It means beginning. It means like birth or conception or, or something that comes forth. If something is begotten, it's created, it's made, it has a beginning. Okay, so we're talking about a son through son or sonship that was created or has a beginning. Now, does that just sound like we're describing the everlasting Jesus that was forever? Now, because listen, the Bible describes Jesus as what? Man, he calls him the everlasting father. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us, right? I'm, listen, the Bible makes it clear. He's here the ancient of days. Or I mean, in fact, in fact, one of the translations that's given for Jesus, there is Ancient of Days, and yet most of the times we use that term for God the Father. Okay? But uh, Jesus, we look to him as, as our uh, high priest, right? And, but Jesus, according to 1 1, did what? Jesus, according to John, uh, excuse me, John 1 1, did he was with the Word? And he was the Word? Excuse me, in the beginning, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And it goes on to say that by him was all things created that was created, right? So Jesus, the Word, okay, the Word is the creator. He's the person of the Godhead that created everything. He's the, he's the person of the Godhead. And most people don't understand. Most people think about God the Father, what we know is God the Father doing this, but he empowered Christ to do this. It says right there that nothing was created that, that he didn't do, right? Am I wrong? It's over there in the book of John somewhere, right? That's right after Revelation, right? I'm kidding. Here we go. Here we go. Where are we going? John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The word beginning is, is a Greek word, arche. And it means as far back as you can imagine, and then way past that. In fact, keep going because there is no point out there where it was. And so the word is telling us that Jesus has always lived. But what's he called here? He's called the word of God. Okay. Now this is going to blow some people's minds. Because as we look at God today, and we look at the Trinity today, we look at, at God the Father, right? He's the big cheese up top. And then we see Jesus, right, the Son, who answers to the Father, he, right? That's the way we see him. And then we got the Holy Ghost over here. So we kind of got this hierarchy that's, that looks like a family structure, okay? Y'all ever thought about this? I got some faces looking at me right now that are like, where am I? We have a structure that looks like a family, and we refer to God the Father and God the Son. Those are valid names for God and for the positions that they entail. And I want to read back in Hebrews here for just a moment. You know, we, we look at Jesus, and uh, we, we get confused when we talk about him. We talk about the Son of God, and we think, well... If this, if this Bible here is talking about him and it's saying that he was uh, begotten, well, that doesn't make sense. If, I mean, if I really want to take the sense of the word to understand that he was begotten, in other words, had a beginning, and yet I'm talking about a God without beginning, one of them is not right. So I have to go back and I have to look in the original languages here to find out what in the world is, is being talked about here. And like I said, the word here is in. And in sonship, in other words a part of God, a part of the Trinity that we know as Jesus Christ, who later manifests, is taken on a position that's, that's known as sonship here. Does that make sense? All right. He says, while being the 
<clears throat> says, he, says he made all the worlds, talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the world of his power, when he had himself purged sins and sat down the right hand of the majesty on high. So we're definitely talking about Jesus here. But the words here are, are some interesting things. The word brightness of his glory. Do you know the word brightness actually is a word that means a reflection? It's like a mirror image. Okay? It's, he is the mirror image of God. In fact, Jesus said, look, you don't know the Father except you see him through me. Right? Because only I know the Father. Only the Father knows the Son. Okay? You don't get to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So, listen, guys, I know I'm kind of throwing a few things out there, but I want to, I want to get to some good points here. The fact that conversations like that exist saying, I'm the way, the truth, and life, and no man gets to him except through me, ought to tell you right there there's more than one part to our Godhead. I'm just saying. And in the, in the beginning there, in the beginning God, in Genesis 1-1, it's a plural. It means more than one. Remember when he says, let us make man in our image? Yeah, there's a word us there, and our, and they're plurals. So, so somehow... This entity, this God entity that's made up of multiple personality persons, I won't say, I won't say but, but, but different entities that make up God, they're so in unison that they, that they are God. They're so in unison. But there's more than just Jesus. See, there's a, there's a whole doctrine out there called Jesus only, and I'm trying to make sure I don't sound like I'm Jesus only because Jesus only is taught that there's God, and then he came down to be Jesus, and then he went back up. But everything was done, and it's all Jesus. But I'm telling you, they have different functions. In fact, the function of sonship is talked about right here. And we're going we're gonna to read here for just a moment. This is back in Hebrews, by the way. And he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. And isn't that interesting? Because he's talking about what happened to him after he was resurrected. That he saved our sins. That he purged our sins. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He says, being made so much better than the angels... He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, Jesus by inheritance. What is inheritance for? Inheritance for is to pass on something that belongs to one generation to another, right? Well, that's an interesting term for a God who always has been. I'm just saying. But he obtained a more uh, excellent name than even the angels. Now, man is made, what, a little lower than all of the angels, right? Okay, so we have Jesus. He's being described here. He's not an angel. He's not a created being. In fact, his name is above the angels, right? <clears throat> For unto which of the angels said at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Did God ever say that to any of the angels? Did he ever call any of them, You're my begotten son. You're my only son. Now, we've, we've got references of the sons of God back in the Old Testament talking about fallen angels. But has he ever looked to an angel and said, you are my begotten. You are the only son, the heir. Okay, well, if he's making that inference here, if, if he's inferring that, uh, that he says that to the angels, he's comparing that to Jesus. Don't I look funny in these glasses? Man, I'm telling you. Oh, I, hey, I can see you now if I hold them just like that. I can't stand these things. Oh, well, bless the Lord. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath an inheritance ordained or obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels he said, Any time thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. He's given you a clue right here what he did. You see, there's an agreement in heaven. There was a plan made for our salvation. And there was a plan made for the kingdom of God that we might all become sons of God. We needed an example to do that. We always talk about Jesus being the first fruits, right? We talk about him being the first fruits of, of redemption. He's the first fruits to be raptured, right? Out of the five raptures lifted, listed in the church or in the Bible? Y'all looking at me like silly. There's five raptures listed in the Bible. It doesn't use the word rapture, it says taking away. 
Jesus and all the saints that had gone before. Remember seeing Aunt, you know, old Aunt Martha running around Jerusalem for 40 days? There were like 500 of them, remember? When, when Jesus rose from the dead, we saw all those. And so he, he, he took the captives, he preached liberty to the captives and took them up to heaven, right? Then we've got the church ourselves. When we go to be with the Lord, because there's a day we're going to go meet him in the air. In the, we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye, right? Amen. Right. Then, then, then we've got 144,000 Jews, the man-child in the end times that come just before the three-and-a-half-year period of a seven-year uh, agreement, uh, right before the Great Tribulation. That's only three-and-a-half years, by the way, not seven. Uh, so we've got, the, we've got the, the 144,000 Jews that come right before the midpoint, and they're taken out by God. They're raptured out right after the three-and-a-half-year point. All right? So there's, there's another rapture. Then all of a sudden, we've got who? We've got the two witnesses that appear. All right, the two witnesses, Enoch and Elijah. Yes, that's the name of them. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. And we got two guys that were taken up and never had to face death. Even Jesus faced death. I'm just saying. And then we have all the tribulation saints and those that are saved in that end time before the thousand-year rule and reign of Christ. Five different times are taken up, but Jesus is the first fruits. And if we want to be included in that, we're going to follow his example. We want to be taken up too, right? All right, so I'm driving along the other day. We're praying. Will and I praying in the Holy Ghost. He's a praying freak, by the way. If you just want somebody to pray for you, that's the man. Um, we're driving along, and we're praying, and we're just shucking my Hyundai and having a blast. And all of a sudden, the Lord speaks to me, and he says, he says in order to prophesy... You have to be a son of God. And when did Jesus become the son of God? I, well, Lord, he's always been. Wow, man. Look at the verbiage that we're looking right here. The word, by the way, for son and also for begotten are words applicable only to a living flesh being. The word begotten is describing a birth process that is of flesh. Now, we know that God is spirit. We know that we know that Jesus, that God the Father, and as we call God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have lived forever. They've been here forever. God always is. He's without beginning. And yet we've got a description right here of the only begotten of the Father that we know to be Christ as a beginning. And the word begotten means the day he became flesh. Now, why am I bringing this up? Why am I confusing everybody? Why am I, like, doing this crazy thing up here? What am I saying? The reason I'm talking about this tonight is because he became a, what we would consider a lesser role, the son subservient to the father, on our behalf. You see, he was, he was begotten as the son. He took on sonship. Now, the words that we have, and, and, I, and I went all through the, the Old Testament, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe just one or two places there. The words that we have in the Old Testament and the, and the appearances of Christ uh, that, that we would say when the, when the angel of the Lord or when, when the Lord appeared to Abraham, for example, and uh, he's getting ready to, uh, the, the Lord has got two angels with him and they're going off to, to Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember that? And the Lord is walking with Abraham. And he tells his angels, hey, you guys go on ahead because uh, why should I withhold anything from my friend? And before we talked about being a friend of God. And so he, God will not withhold anything from his friend. That being, that entity, that angel of the Lord was the creator God that created the universe. The same God that spoke through the burning bush. The same God that led it with a, a, a pillar of fire and stuff, the children of Israel. The same God that walked with Adam in the garden and who called out, Adam, where are you? Where are you? And they're hiding from him. All right? That same God, that God that's mentioned there, is Jesus. He's that part of the Godhead. He's the creator. He's the one that has interacted with man. Oh, oh, we're getting deep in here for a second. <clears throat> and again, this is, this is uh, verse 6. 
uh, of Hebrews 1. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels of the angels, he said, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. God the Father just anointed and ordained God the Son to carry on a position of sonship in the kingdom. You all following me? I'm telling you what. I want to look at something else over here just for a minute. You're probably asking why in the world am I bringing all this up? Because we're going to get to the teaching in just a moment. Y'all laugh at me. In the, in the book of Luke, <clears throat> chapter 1, you know the story. Mary's there. An angel appears to her and says, hey, by the way, um, you're going to have a child. I know you've never been with a man, but it's okay. Don't be afraid because it's going to be the Son of God. That's just your average walk to school there. That's all I'm saying. Mary said to the angel in verse 34, actually, I'll back up. I'll back up here because 32 is it's amazing. In fact, I can back the whole place up to 31. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, bring forth the son, shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. Notice it didn't say he's going to be, he is going to be the son of the highest. I'm just saying, he's going to be called the son. There's a very specific reason why. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. We ought to be shouting. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the Holy Ghost answered, excuse me, the angel answered, and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. The word sonship always, always, always refers to humanity, not to a deity. As God, Jesus had no beginning. Micah 5, 2, John 1, 1 and 2, we just quoted there. Uh, He, Jesus himself, the God, the God person, uh, that's that part of the Trinity, uh, was never begotten. Uh, he would have had a beginning, and as God, he couldn't be God if he had a beginning. Does that make sense? So the word begotten is only, only for the for natural man, for in the in the flesh. There, um, it, it, as man, when he came as Christ, when he came as Jesus, he had a beginning. That's why I refer, we refer to him as the only begotten of the Father. He had a beginning here, right? All right. Uh, in, in these passages here, and I'm kind of summarizing because I want to I want to go somewhere else here in just a moment. God is referring to humanity, and He's letting us know that He had a plan to save humanity. He had a plan that we would operate in His kingdom, like Him. Go all the way back into into Genesis, where it says that let us make man in our image. What is the image of God? Anybody know? I, yeah, holiness, and so, but there's a lot of neat things about God that differentiate him from the angels, for example. One of them is he can create. He's a creative being, okay? Being made in his image also means that from this point we're an eternal being, okay? We have a beginning, we have a conception time, but we're eternal in this direction over here in the forever and ever. And that's why it's really a pretty simple choice. Do you want to spend forever and ever with God, or do you want to have a forever and ever that's in the same place prepared for the devil and his angels? I'm just saying. It's, it's a fairly easy choice if you ask me. But um, anyways, uh, Jesus had a plan. The, the Lord had a plan to save us and to set an example for us. Wow, what's this got to do with prophesying? Funny thing you asked. All right, we're going to go back into 1 Kings chapter 19. 
These are a couple of great characters that we look at. If, if, we, had, if we had to name a, a couple of the greatest prophets ever in the Bible, these two right here in this one chapter would be two of them. We're going to talk about Elijah and Elisha. Right? All right. Hallelujah. I love you, David. You're so cool. <clears throat> All right. Now, to catch you up to speed here, there's this guy named Elijah, and he's a pretty bad dude in the Lord. And, uh, man, he's taken out prophets and everything else, you know, the prophets of Baal and, and all this stuff. I'm Dude, he's, he's awesome. And then there's this queen named Jezebel that says, well, the same thing you just did to them, I'm going to do to you. So being the great man of God he is, he runs. I have a saying. I say, how dumb can you get and still breathe? I want to know. Because I've done this. I'm not saying I've slew, you know 400 prophets or something. But I've had a great move of God in my life. And then turn right around and, and, and the enemy or somebody said something through the enemy. Like, I'm going to get to you. And I'm like, oh, God, oh, God. I'm going to hide in a closet somewhere. You know, rescue me, oh, God. Okay, listen, I'm just saying these are real people. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to read a lot of chapter 19 here, but real quickly. Ahab told Jezebel that all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger under Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Ju in Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. Okay, you don't know then there's the, there's the wind and there's the earthquake and there's the fire and, you know, all this stuff there. And God is saying, or Elijah is saying, Where are you, God? And the wind comes and God's not in the wind. And Where are you, Lord? And the earthquake happens and he's not in the earthquake. And where are you, Lord? And he's not in the fire and stuff. But then what happens? Still small voice. Mm. Wow. A still small voice comes to, comes to him and says, Hey, where are you? What are you doing? Well, I had to come here because I could be slain. Hey, where are you? <laughs> Can you have the conversation? I mean, you got to ask somebody three, four times, What are you doing? They're probably trying to make a point. I'm just saying, where are you? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Finally, Elijah gets up. Finally gets up and he leaves. And he starts heading out. And uh, verse 19 says, we, He departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shepheth, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. And Elijah passed him by and cast his mantle upon him. Elijah is an awesome prophet. Elisha is a kid in the field. In fact, it says he's got 12, 12 yoke of oxen. Most of us think he's got you know, 12 cattle out there, and boy, this guy's running a big plow. This is like, I mean, you see the great big tractors with like eight wheels and stuff on it? Yeah, well, the plows they used back then were like wimpy plows. In fact, it was so silly that when it says he's with the 12th, the way that they actually set these things up is, is that these little plows made out of little sticks and, and, and pieces of tree and stuff actually went in front of the cow, and the cow kind of pushed it. Didn't go very deep. You know, it's like a road grader or a, or a bulldozer. It, it wasn't digging way down in there. It was just kind of scraping the surface, and that's, that's how they went. This, this guy, while well, he was out working a lot, what it shows the way he was working and the way that these, these plows were made and, and what he was doing with these yoke of oxen was he was working a whole bunch but not getting very much done. It's a neat picture because it's like, it's like pushing a stick. It's like pushing a stick in the dirt expecting to plow and get ready for planting. You know, it's not digging neat. You're not, you're not dragging this thing. It's just kind of pushing along the surface there. That's what he's doing. And he's back there by the 12th. In other words, he's got one he's dragging back here, and the others are kind of pushing sticks out in front of him. The guy's not accomplishing a lot. And here comes this prophet, Elijah, 
And it says he cast his mantle upon him. What do you mean cast a mantle upon him? Any idea of what in the world? We all talk about, I want that mantle. I want to be able to prophesy. I want to be able to heal. Oh, I'd love the healing anointing. I'd love the mantle for soul winning, you know, to be upon me. What, is, what does that mean to have a mantle thrown on you? Yes, it means the anointing, but I want to show you something really, really simple that's really deep. The word here that is used for, for mantle means sheepskin. He threw a sheepskin on him. We all want to get all fancy. Want to get all spiritual. He threw a sheepskin on him. Why in the world would he do that? Why would why would this great prophet of God have a sheepskin? Why would he why would he throw a sheepskin on somebody? Well, gee whiz, I read back in Genesis chapter three, where this guy and this gal partook of some fruit they weren't supposed to eat. And they tried to hide themselves. And so they put on like these fig leaf coverings and stuff. And then the Lord comes into the garden and says, hey, where are you? And they're trying to hide themselves. He says, who told you to do that? Well, we kind of felt a little naked. So the Lord took what? The skins of animals. Oops, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. I want you to see something, what happens right here. Okay, this is, this, you've heard this story a million times, but I just, I just want you to see what this says right here in the end of this chapter. And then we're going we're gonna to talk about it further, and then we're going to see God do something. Amen? So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back, for what have I done to thee? <clears throat> Guy shows a three, uh, throws a sheepskin on a kid plowing out there, or a young person plowing. He's acting as a servant. He's just not accomplishing a lot. Throws this mantle upon him. There is no discussion that happens here. The kid says, hey, let me go say to bye to mom and dad so I can go with you. Elijah the prophet says, and look, he basically says, leave me alone. What did I do to you? Well, what do you mean what did you do to me? You just threw the, the mantle on me. The guy sensed the anointing. The guy sen- He senses, who? I perceive thee to be a prophet. There's no words necessary. When the sheepskin hit him, and there had been the shedding of blood, by the way. There's a, a covering or atonement that the prophet just put over this young person here. Y'all following me? This guy whipped the blood of Jesus on him. You, you don't have to have a big discussion when you've had an encounter with the blood of Jesus. That's why sometimes when we lay hands on people up here, they fall down. Because they can't stand up anymore. Because the Spirit of God hits them. It's the blood that makes the atonement. And before Christ came as a man, before He became the only begotten of the Father, before that person in the Godhead became the Son and the other person became the Father and they took on a subservient role so that they might set an example for us here on earth. There was the temporary recovering by the shedding of the blood of animals. And so Elijah throws this mantle, this anointing, this sheepskin, the, the, the shedding of blood is covering Elisha now. Elisha gets it. He gets hit. Oh my, whoa! <laughs> He, he senses the anointing. He said, look, I just got to go say bye to my folks and I'm going with you. The prophets used to walk in, in it. He's the same guy that was just hiding in a cave in all his bravery. What did I do to you? Why, why, why do you want to go with me? What's, what's up with that? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them. Now this is Elisha. He took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. And then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered to him. Elisha got a hold of something when the blood of Jesus hit him. And, this, and I'm talking about a sheepskin here, but it's representative of the blood of the lamb. 
When the blood of the lamb got a hold of him, nothing else mattered. In fact, this is like, this is like you, know, you heard about Columbus and the guys coming to America, and uh, we always talk about getting real close and wanting to turn back, so captains would often burn their ship when they were close to shore so they couldn't go back. That's what he just did. He cooked the cattle and gave them to the rest of the servants to eat. And he burned up all the tools he was using, those fancy plows and everything else. He got rid of his source of sustenance. He got rid of his earthly inheritance. And he ran after and ministered to Elijah. And we know the relationship between Elisha and Elijah, that Elijah took him on as a father would a son and mentored him. And he became Elisha's spiritual father. Elisha ends up asking for a double portion later, right? The whole double portion thing is driven by the act of sonship, the act of submission, of giving up everything in your earthly arsenal that you have, burning the boats, boiling the cattle, burning the sticks, whatever, and walking off with God because you've had an encounter with the sonship of God. You've had an encounter with the blood of Christ. Nothing else matters now except more of Him. This is the beginning of what happened in the prophetic for Elisha. In fact, when he was taken up in the, in the whirlwind, when Elijah goes in the whirlwind, and the whirlwind is representative of Christ, by the way, if you don't know that, tornadoes are, represent Christ and revival and the Spirit of the Lord in the, in the Word of God. So when we see a whirlwind, he's, taking up, he's taken up into Christ. He's taken up into the anointing. And he literally leaves what behind? The sheepskin is left behind again. The double portion that Elisha is claiming that he's wanting for his life is literally passed on because of his sonship. I don't know if I do justice to describe the picture of who Jesus is, but he is God. He is part of the Godhead. There was the Word. There's what we call the Ancient of Days. Or the Everlasting Father. Although Jesus is called that too, isn't he? The Everlasting Father. The Ancient of Days and the Holy Spirit. They had a discussion in heaven and Jesus said, we need to show them how to approach God. I will take on the role of a son. Ancient of days says, I will take on the role of the Father. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm telling you, man, this, this, this isn't an accident that happened. This is a plan. Now if I look at Jesus, I don't just want to talk about Jesus for a minute, if that's okay. I want to look at Jesus because he's not just some man that people say he's a man. I know he came in the flesh. I get that. But even in the flesh, he lived a sinless life. He wasn't born of man. He didn't have a father giving seed. He had the Holy Ghost for a dad. He was begotten. He had a beginning point. We're talking about his flesh and the ministry here on earth. But this guy in the flesh who was all man and yet all God, this, this man was able to conquer sin. This man was able to defeat it, live a, a sinless, perfect life for us as an example for us. He died. He rose again and is seated, as we read earlier, at the right hand of the Father. Now we look at that earthly part there, but I got to tell you for a second. I don't know about you guys, but I got to, you know, I love my dad and I want to honor my dad. But I can honestly tell you there was a time in my life, I don't mean to say anything upsetting, dad, but I thought my dad lost his mind for a while. And the reason was, is I was in my late teens and early 20s. You see, he's a rock. <laughs> I just kind of went wandering around this way and nothing he said made sense. When I got to be about mid-20s, my dad got a brain. <laughs> no, right, Dad? Jesus in the flesh is 100% cognizant of his role being appointed as the Son of God. 
And he's 100% cognizant of the fact that he needs to honor his Father in heaven. If you don't think they had different wills, I want to take you to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus is sweating blood and he says, not my will, but thine. You see, his flesh had a different idea than taking on the sins of the world. But being God, <clears throat> being the Word made flesh, he followed through with what had to be the plan. But I'm sitting there thinking about Jesus and I'm thinking about the glory and the former glory of God as creator of Jesus, as Christ, as the creator of the universe. I, I don't mean to use, you know, crazy terms. This is one bad dude. This, I mean, he's God. He's powerful. He's not some wimp. I mean, this is the guy that told the stars to go out there and stay there until he told them to move. You know what I'm saying? He gave that up for you. He stepped out of, he's still creator, but he took on a subservient role as the son of God. I asked you a question a while ago, and I, and I asked, I said, uh, do any of you know in the end of days where it was, or, or if at any time does, does God the Father ever come to earth? I got yes, I got no. Which one do you think is going to be? Y'all ever think about that? I'm telling you what, this is cool. Let me get back in here into Daniel chapter 7. <coughs> oh, let's see here where we're going. <coughs> uh, starting about verse 13, Daniel chapter 7. Check this here. Now, this is prophesying, and we're going to talk about the prophetic here. That's why all the, we're talking all this to talk about the prophetic. And I know it's getting late, but Pastor said I could talk till he flew back from D.C. <clears throat> chapter, chapter 7, verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. When do you suppose that is? What? I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. This sounds to me like sometime Jesus is coming to earth again. Because he's called the Son of Man here, isn't he? We're talking a future tense. We're talking the end of days. Actually, we're talking about right about the battle of Armageddon. Okay? Coming back to prepare for that. The Antichrist has gone, lost his mind, declared himself God, took over Israel, left Israel for a moment to go fight the battle of Gog and Magog. That's China and Russia. He comes back in in a, a treaty with them he comes back as Gog and Magog comes back to Jerusalem it says that here in the word that that uh, Jerusalem had escaped from under the sword in other words they defeated the Antichrist forces for a little bit threw his guys out now this crazy megalomaniac is mad and he's coming back to Jerusalem and he's gonna show them and so this is where they're making it almost into Jerusalem here. In fact, about to take half of Jerusalem. And this is where the Lord steps in. And this is what Daniel is seeing. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. If you didn't know there were multiple persons in the Godhead, this ought to fix it for you right here. Because the Son of Man is brought in before the Ancient of Days. In other words, God the Father. When Jesus comes back, this is a prophecy here, when Jesus comes back to, to, to whip up on the Antichrist and his forces and to, and, to, and to see him killed in the field and take dominion over the earth, when he's going to rule and reign here, when he comes back, he comes back to who? God the Father has come down out of heaven, seated off of his throne. He's come down into heaven and he's come down to cheer his son on to victory. You got God the Father sitting there. Jesus, the Son of Man, comes in the clouds into him and they usher Jesus, the Son of Man, usher him in to the Ancient of Days so his dad can be there and oversee the victory of the Son. I'm telling you. 
And if you wonder if that's him, it says in verse 14, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. There is power in the sonship of God. There is a power that's there when we, when we submit ourselves to God. There is victory coming. I could preach right down that. You, you got the picture. Jesus coming in the clouds. We're all looking for him. What's he doing? He's coming to the Father. The Father has already come that we might have victory. He's here on earth. He might have got here a split second before, but he's here. God the Father, the Ancient of Days, is seated on his throne there. And Jesus comes into them and they discuss the battle plan. Because <laughs> it was written a long time ago. But he comes in as the son of man. He comes in as a servant. Now I'm going to just tell you right here where we're going. Because we could talk in 2 Kings. We could talk a number of other examples. If you want to operate in the gifts of God. And I'll say healing any of the ministries, the prophetic, you need to be a son of God. Jesus came and set that example. And listen, I'm just lifting Jesus up here. I'm not, when I say that he wasn't the son forever, going that way, he took on the son as a function, as a position that he willfully submitted, that he willfully took that position. I will play the role of the son and I will submit to you as father. That's trust right there. Because he is God. And yet he's going to trust the other part of God that he's going to make right decisions. And he says, not my will, but yours. I'm going to willfully submit. So I'm saying to you, if we want to do this, if we want to be called the sons of God, if we're given a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, if we want to say, like Jesus said, hey, greater things will you do, greater things will you see we're going to accomplish even greater things here because of what because of his sonship and our ability to become sons does that make sense you can't get it out of a bubblegum machine you can't get out of one of those neat vending machines that picks up the little fur animals and you know what i mean little furry things you can't give it by handing money away you get it by submission Rule number one. Some people call them the Ten Commandments. Rule number one. I'm God, you're not. We can stop right there. We have to understand that if we are to operate in any of the gifts, we need to be as sons of God. Because all power, all authority was given unto the Son so that we might have victory. We might be joint heirs in Jesus. Does that make sense? Man, I feel like we've been rambling all over the place. But there's a lot to this. There's a lot to this. We have to understand what it is to be a servant of the Most High God, to submit as a son would to a father. And that should be without question, without argument, without grumbling. You know, my dad tells me to do something now. He tells me jump on my way up. I'm going to ask him how high. There won't even be a discussion about when and where. Uh, yes, sir. I hope that rebellion is, is gone far from me because we did have the rod of discipline in the home. <laughs> That's my mother. Wait till your father gets home. We have to be sons of God. We have to submit, lay our flesh down. I go back to the blood of Jesus. I go back to that, that the, the, even the skin of animals and stuff as the forerunner there. But we look in the Old Testament. We look in these. And I just brought one example there of the Son coming in unto the Father. But they were, he was looking in the future. He, he was prophesying the Son of Man. He was prophesying that this one would be called the Son of Man. That he would take that position willfully. Now to me, I'm, I'm just going gonna, I'm just gonna to close and say this. The fact that he would lay down his position in heaven. 
and walk in this dirt bag suit, this bag of bones. The fact that he would give up. And listen to me, I mentioned before, he's a creator. He's God. He's, he's everything, all power. And he says, you know what? So I can have a relationship with Clark. So I can have a relationship with these people that I'm putting here. I will step down out of that position and I will be called the son. And I will function as the son of God. So that, so that, when Anna comes along, she has an example. So that we can follow in his footsteps. Because he doesn't expect anything of us that he didn't go through himself. Amen? So if you want to operate in the prophetic, that's where you need to go. If you want to operate in the gifts, if you want to, if you want to function in the kingdom of God, we've got to come as what? Little children. Right? Listen, I know we've talked about a lot of stuff here tonight, and, and I hope it makes sense. I just want you to see something about Jesus, and that is he loves you so much. He loves you so, so much that he left his estate his rightful estate and came down voluntarily to be the son and to create a family structure that we can understand, that we could live in, that we could be in and that we could follow his example. There's a lot of people that want to operate in all those gifts but they haven't submitted themselves. They think because they show up at church Tuesday night or Saturday or Sunday that, uh, you know, I know somehow it's like a free pass that you get it with attendance, but you don't get it. You get it with submission. You get to submission. Just in case nobody heard that, you get it by submission. Amen? Amen. I'd like everybody to stand up that, that, that can, if you stand up.